This episode of the Switchcast is produced by Shane Murray, our honored Patreon member and Switch Knight. Hey everybody, I'm KC. And I'm JV. And this is the Switchcast, the podcast for the sandwich epicure. And uh, we have a delicious episode for you this week. We are continuing our month-long conversation and in-depth analysis of possibly one of the oldest debates, most divisive arguments we've had in the community in a long time here. And that is hot sandwiches versus cold sandwiches and i I, we're going to go to the uh listeners emails in just a little bit but i think we have a little a few more pieces of controversy want to kind of close out here so i mean you've been a very big proponent of the cold sandwich side of this argument i mean what's not to like about cold sandwiches i mean you have more flavor you have more texture there's a lot more you can do with it i mean sure you can do some of that with a hot sandwich, but the actual temperature of the meat is just going to muddle everything else. But the temperature is where, like, when, when the meat is heated up, right, that is when the juices come out and there's more flavor. You're going to get a soggy sandwich. It's just going to get messy. It's just going to go all over the place. No, look, maybe if you're some sort of, like, slovenly cold sandwich eater. <laughs> wow. All right. Okay. But if you are a sophisticated hottie <laughs> and you eat your hot sandwiches, you're gonna you know, you you know what you're doing, all right? And it takes a certain level of finesse, but sure, it's a payoff. Because here's the deal, here's the deal. When I eat a cold sandwich, it's like I'm eating ham and I'm eating lettuce and I'm eating all these things and they're all just in there. But when I eat a hot sandwich, it all becomes one. It fuses them together. But I mean you don't have that many hot sandwiches. The only two that come up to mind are Philly cheesesteak sandwiches and uh, the meatball marinara sandwiches. Other than that, anything else, it just kind of gets uh, muddled. The Hello, grilled cheese, anybody? Ah, I like, forgot about grilled cheese. But I mean, I would have technically, I mean, yes, it's a sandwich, but I mean, in our conversation, it's not relevant because we're talking about more meats. We want something that's a cold meat. I mean, sure, you're not going to eat a cold cheese sandwich. I mean, who does that? Yeah, only only infidels and people who <laughs> <laughs> people who need bibs to eat. Indeed, indeed. But I mean, a cold sandwich. I mean, sandwiches in general. I mean, that's how they were made to be. They were made to be cold. That's no, how it all started. They were started. cold because we hadn't yet invented the technology to conveniently warm food. I would disagree. Dang, I would we disagree. used. You know what else we used to eat? cold we used to eat the flesh of animals cold we used to oh gosh that was a long time ago long time ago but then but then man advanced and we made cooked meats yes with the invention of fire evolved and took advantage of this and now we have the technology to grill up a succulent sandwich at home but you gotta look at the history of sandwiches sandwiches they started taking root in, in our modern culture around the Industrial Revolution. And around that time, that's when things started to, you know, we got our modern sandwich, the idea of it. Yep, but the Industrial Revolution, they had not yet invented the toaster. Now we have toasters in everyone's Wait, they house. Had, they had simplistic toasters. I mean, they could put a piece of bread inside I'm just saying, fire. like, when we first start inventing machinery that can do this all easily, when you could just stick some pieces of bread, hit a switch, bam, hot So you're thinking, bread. like, something like in New York, like the, um... Like the hot dog stands and so forth. That's what you're kind of getting. Oh at. no! You're opening a whole other can of words when you start asking whether or not <laughs> hot dogs are sandwiches. We that is a whole oh, other month of con- conversation. In fact, I'm probably going to save that for July, and we'll talk about it then. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah, but, I mean, you can't go wrong with a good, nice, cold sandwich. I mean, uh, I mean, I mean, the restaurant chains that are out there right now. Subway and Quiznos are the biggest example. Quiznos being the hot sandwiches and they are the proponents of the toasted sub yeah but i mean look at subway they have a whole bunch more of selections they have a lot more that you can do and subway is the cheapest alternative that is because they can't be bothered to actually warm subway is not cheap i mean the tuna sandwich it's seven bucks okay 
Like, look, look, Subway, I, I, I'm fond of Subway. I love all sandwiches and all sandwich chains. But literally, like, Subway is the cheapest franchise. If you want to start a fast food restaurant, it is the easiest, lowest barrier to entry franchise to start and that is why there's so many of them and you know what? i'm not i'm not going to argue on subway being cheap yes they do have some cheap sandwiches but it's, hey it's look at them and it's it's affordable i love to put it that way maybe i shouldn't say cheap it's it's affordable it's the most affordable yes it's affordable option. and that's why they're still around and quiznos is kind of disappearing but quiznos that's because they hold to a higher standard and they, they try to not. offer people something more than the cheapest bargain basement sandwiches available and i, and, and I respectfully admit, disagree okay all right you know what let's let this go into the hands of the listeners and see what their final words on this on this issue and before we put this to bed here so you want to kick us off with one of the uh community pulse uh, feedbacks we got here Yes, definitely. Edward Galvin, or Galvan, says, Cold for sure. You can get a lot more flavor by having the juices redistribute throughout the meat when it cools down. In addition, you can have more texture with cold sandwiches since you don't have to worry about it getting soggy from the juices. Now, wait, am, am, am I misinterpreting what he wrote there? Because that sounds like when he says the juices, the way they mix when they cool down, is he suggesting you let it get hot first and then, like, have it cooled after a a baking session or something i think he's actually more tapping into culinary um just culinary skills in general where you cook a, let's say for, for example a steak when you cook a steak you don't serve it right away hot you have to let it cool down a bit let it redistribute um let the juices kind of okay seep okay. into the rest of the meat but i mean um for the most part, it seems like he has pretty much the right idea. I mean, that's what, in <laughs> essence, a cold sandwich is supposed to be. It's supposed to have all the nice, juicy parts of the meat redistribute. Okay. You don't want it on, the, on the on the bread, you don't want a soggy bread, do you? <laughs> no. See, that's another thing, right? If you don't know what you're doing and you just like melt stuff on there willy nilly and throw butter or whatever, you're going to get soggy bread. But you know what? It just take with a little bit of skill. You can keep the bread crispy on the outside and let it still absorb just enough of the juices on the inside of the bread. But you could have the outer crust still be crisp. Anyway, Abe Abe wrote in. I usually favor hot sandwiches. Nothing against cold ones. It's just that hot sandwiches are more satisfying and leave you feeling like you just ate a real meal. Take it from a fat guy. We know these things. If you're not <laughs> fat, your opinion is only worth half here. Now go order your six-inch cold cut. Mic drop. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait, wait. He kind of seemed like he turned up the end right there. <laughs> I think he was being uh, dismissive of your nah. Subway sandwich there. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so. Benji Kong says, sandwiches should be cold. I am British, so I know these things. The Earl of Sandwich would be turning in his grave if he knew people were eating hot sandwiches. I am all for progress, but serving hot sandwiches is taking it too far. And I would agree with Benji Kong. Benji <laughs> Kong, you're a good far. man. You people always are holding back progress, all right? We are on the cutting edge. We are on the frontier of sandwich advancement, and you just want to keep us in the Stone Age with our frozen cold cuts without applying the technology that Prometheus gave us. That's what I'm going to call it. These are Promethean sandwiches. That's my term for them now. Prometheus sandwiches. <laughs> well, then let me ask you this. How many cold sandwich types do you know of versus hot sandwich types i feel like there's a significant amount more of cold sandwiches out there yeah there's there's more because people have been developing them longer because they're just like the like how many electric cars are there right now there's one or two <laughs> via because they're the frontier they are the new ground that people are developing for all right nah. and so honestly all the greatest sandwiches, you can take a cold sandwich, and most of the time you can make it hot, but the best, the kings of sandwich, Philly cheese steaks, are hot sandwiches, and they reign supreme over almost all Wait, consumables, no, nonsense, period. nonsense. Yeah, no. No, no, I, I cannot just believe that. No. <laughs> Um, I, I'll read this one because this also brings up our uh, controversy. Sergio Gonzalez wrote in, definitely hot because hamburgers are sandwiches and hot dogs might be too. S <laughs> sidestepping hot dogs again, but 
hamburgers. He brings another. That's another great point. That is like that the is a all American I mean, sandwich. If you are a cold sandwich lover, you are a communist and a I, person who hates no. America. Oh, I no, no, no. I wholeheartedly disagree with you. I mean, yeah, technically hamburgers are sandwiches, but I feel they have evolved into be into their own class of food. I think you're just trying to uh, write off the greatest competition right there. Nah, like like Benji Kong said, the Earl of Sandwich would be turning in his grave right now, and I totally agree with that. Yeah, but what's he know? He's dead. <laughs> He's the one who made the sandwiches. He made it because he had a gambling habit, okay? He obviously wasn't playing with a full deck, all right? He okay, had so a you, gambling you gotta go habit, read your history. couldn't I mean, take himself on, away, and that's why he invented it. <laughs> the lush. <laughs> all right, let's cl- close this out with uh, the, the middle ground here. So Adam Bass says, it depends on the sandwich. Meatball or any kind of chicken sandwich. Hot. My favorite is the sweet onion teriyaki from Subway. Good choice there. Turkey or ham. Cold. So I guess he is right. I mean, both types of sandwiches are technically good. It just depends on, you know, what you're craving at that moment in time and what type of sandwich you're getting. But I mean, I would still want to say that cold sandwiches are better. But for, you know, the sake of argument, I will acknowledge that some hot sandwiches are good. I look, I will I'll let you have the last word on this, all right? And we've got to move on because April Fools has passed and so too has this conversation, so we have to move on to other topics and get back to what this podcast is really about. Shall Definitely. We? We'll just have to take it on to Discord. <laughs> Smokey tips hitting that 333. You can't stand this hot, then you can't chill with me. So bring your friends, be going on a wild ride. Herb sauce, tender meats, heat up your inside. So don't change the diesel, turn it up a little. Got some cheesy drizzle, dripping on my chisel. Waiting on the bristle, the pizzle, the diesel G's. When the cheese hits your tongue, it'll scream. Oh shit. Hungry Hi, all right, everybody. How's it going? And yes, this is now the real Switch cast, uh, the podcast for the Nintendo Switch enthusiast. And I have to give a special thanks to my uh, stand-in co-host for this evening. You all know him uh, better as Sun Worshipper, but he is our honored patron and a longtime Switch Kaiser, Mr. Edward Galvan. Hello, everyone. Uh, Tell us a little bit about yourself. How did you get involved with the Switch cast and what do you do? How did did you, uh, you know, what's your background with the Switch here? All right. Well, I got involved with the SwitchCast a while ago. It's been well over a year now. It was way back when they announced the Switch and a few months before March. And I was just scouring the internet for any information I can actually find on the Switch. I was a little bit obsessed, you can say. So um, I came across a few podcasts, the SwitchCast being one of them. And, you know, I subscribed to them all. And, you know, as time went on and after the um, the Switch finally came out... Um, Eventually, uh, the other podcasts, they kind of stopped producing as mu- many, or they stopped producing as much episodes. And the only one left was the Switchcast. And overall, I did enjoy, um, both you, um, Casey and JV. You guys were both lighthearted. It was just a fun <laughs> show to get into. And you guys did provide a lot of information. And it was just a joy to listen to you guys all the time. <laughs> but for the most part, I stayed, I was a subscriber, you know, gosh, um, since you know before the switch came out but i didn't become a patreon member until um october the end of october um i remember listening to a few of your uh podcasts and at the end you would give your you know your little speech about patreon and to be honest i did not know what it was um eventually i googled it and i found out that you know it's where you guys can support local artists or you know various people and you know i wholeheartedly was behind what you guys were doing you know i believed in you guys and i wanted the show to continue on so i decided to become a member you know Uh, you know that's a good point though um i i i personally use patreon not only as a producer here but there are a lot of great things to follow on there i actually support a couple of like artists people who just make comics that i got into and uh it's a great place to peruse even if you're just going there and you're not necessarily deciding whether to back us or not i definitely suggest patreon is just a place to peruse and find lots of things that you might be into anyway yeah no definitely if you do go there and you're like you know what i yeah i do like what casey and jv are producing you can go there and subscribe to us and throw us a dollar to five whatever a month to keep this show going and uh, you know just support us in expanding what we do there that's my once a month shout out for people to do that it helps overall to keep you guys 
producing these podcasts for all of us to enjoy. And I know that um, as as more people contribute, there's more things that you and JV are both able to do. Actually, one great example of one of the things we can do because of that is JV. The reason he's not here is because he's already shipped off and he's on it. He, he should be at PAX actually right now. Uh, he oh, sent man, all the fun he's having. Ah, I'm sure. I'm sure. Yeah. And it, it's crazy that it started already, you know, on Thursday and they're doing the, this four day long thing here. I will be heading out uh, tomorrow night around 4 a.m. I'm going to be leaving Yikes. my apartment because I have to catch a bus to Boston at 6 a.m. from the city. And uh, so I oh, and if you want to follow every step of my journey starting at 4 a.m. and going through all of packs with videos. I am going to be posting lots of videos and photos uh, from packs as I'm going through there on the Lens stream. If you're not familiar, Lens is kind of like a uh, Instagram. It's like an Instagram, Instagram yeah. feed that uh, only Patreon members will have access to. So if you want to just sign up for like $1 just to have access to it, that would be fine. But I'm going to be posting... All my encounters there throughout the weekend, even when I'm not at something like that, I always post stuff on there. But this weekend in particular is going to be very flooded with posts, so I hope everybody enjoys that. And if you have any requests of stuff you want me to go check out or do, definitely let me know. I'm going to be checking out – I spend about half my time at the Indie Alley where I just meet all the indie developers and they're very talkative. So we'll have lots of interviews and hopefully JV and I get together and do a few recordings together. Yeah, no, definitely. I mean I look forward to um... – looking at those yeah all right very cool thank you oh and by the way great jv impersonation for our intro there thank you thank you very much <laughs> i'm sure you fooled everybody <laughs> <laughs> probably not jv but you know oh yeah i mean you know i mean even he could be like wait a second i don't remember doing a sandwich podcast <laughs> like when did but... i do this <laughs> all right why don't we shift gears get into the real show and start talking about the game time shall we definitely all right, game time, and uh, we have uh, a few different titles to talk about today. Uh, the first thing I wanted to talk about, actually, was I got my hands on Payday 2, finally, after much hype from people. Oh, yeah, Darkest was definitely hyping that one yeah, up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, I'm, you know, I, w I was excited to try it out. It's It, it kind of, it's outside of my comfort zone in that I'm not a FPS guy, generally. The closest thing I ever got into was Splatoon, so. Um, but this one had a hook, that seemed interesting to me, you know? Um, are you familiar with the Payday series? Not entirely. I mean, all I know is basically what was talked on Discord, mostly from Darkus, and just a few clips that he put up there. Okay. So so the general premise is this isn't just a first-person shooter with, like, like, you know, where you're in a war or fighting through stages in a, in a linear kind of fashion. These are generally heists. Or other criminal missions that you're you're setting out on, uh, with a, quite a varying degree of like complexity. Uh, some of them, are, okay. yeah, some of them are simply go in. A lot of them kind of follow a formula of like get into this building uh, and as surreptitiously as possible break into a safe, get the money, and get out. And some other complications tend to come up here and there. Uh, you can tend to play it very stealthily and or and be sneaky, or you can go and just start shooting everything in your way and <laughs> do it the the messy way. <laughs> Sounds kind of like my way. I'm just kidding. Yeah. Um. I so when you start playing it, there's a little tutorial and it kind of shows you the uh, the basic uh, flow of a stage. Generally speaking, not as say all stages. You actually start out before you engage in the mission proper you're in this like casing mode where your characters like like everyone's seen in the trailers and stuff of the game the characters have like these iconic masks right these like very uh noticeable you know series of masks and there are yeah, all no. sorts of ones that you could choose from to customize your character when the mask is on that means it's game time and that's when you actually start engaging in the mission but before you start you start with you know, just your face, no mask on, and that lets you just kind of be an average citizen walking around, maybe positioning yourself, checking out the area, seeing where the guards are before you actually raise any suspicion. But you can't do anything. You're not even allowed to, like, like pick a lock or you can't pull out your gun. You can't do anything that would be considered suspicious while your mask is not on. But you can maybe, like, walk into a place as long as you don't like 
walk past a guard or something like that. Eventually, when you're ready and you're done getting in position, you put on your mask and now you're in action mode. And then anything you do might raise an alarm. You can still try to be stealthy if you, let's say, cut a hole in a fence, sneak in a place, take out guards. If you take somebody out, you have to, like, stick them in a body bag sometimes and hide the body before you can, uh, you know, make sure no one else finds it. There's a lot of guards where you might have to answer their radio for them to make sure that the, uh, you know, whoever's on the other end doesn't get suspicious and all sorts of stuff like that. And that's at least how the tutorial teaches you how to play the game, that you're trying to stay stealthy as long as possible. And then on some missions, there's going to be a point where there's just an inevitable police have been called and now you have to like blast your way through the rest of the stage. There's also missions that are just purely run and gun. Like there's one where I had to go into this uh, Santa's workshop that's actually packaging cocaine gifts and you have to run in and you have to start shooting at these elves to like start making you nice. cocaine packages and then you have to kind of guard them and uh, bring out all these bags of drugs. So you play the dark Santa there. Yeah, right, right, right. At least that's how the experience is, like I said, in, in the one player mode. The real place this is aimed for is the online and um, okay. you can play with up to three other people and AI fills in for you when you're in one player mode, which has its plus and minuses. P- the pro is that they're immortal bullet sponges that can just always shoot things for you. It doesn't sound like much of a challenge with them like that. But they don't like help you with any of like the real tasks. They don't like, they'll never pick up okay. a bag of money and help you carry it out. You'll have to like, you'll have to make four <laughs> trips for money bags. Wow. You can't just carry all the bags at once, you know, just have it all. No, and and they won't pick up a single bag of money for you. You'll have to do it four times running through a gauntlet each way. But they'll, you know, they try to compensate by just being immortal gunners. But in online, things can work a little smoother. You can have everybody pick a role, like I'm going to be the lookout. I'm going to, you know, be the sniper on top of the building. I'm going to be the guy that breaks into the safe. At least this is the theory. They even let you have a little planning stage. There's a map and you could put on the map like where you want to be or what kind of, there's a very simple form of communication you could do there with other players online and just be like, you know, just kind of show them what your general plan is. No one I've ever seen uses this though. (laughs) Nobody does this. So, so one thing I do want to ask you, because I did notice that you mentioned a few things on the discord chat Mm -hmm. um, the other day was that you had some troubles during your gameplay um, can you just talk about that? Like, okay. what exactly happened? So during this, I'm glad you asked. Actually, um, during the tutorial missions, or at least in the solo mode, I hit a few glitches that just made some of the stages unwinnable. In that, like, I, like I was talking about how I have to pick up bags of money and like bring them to a delivery point. There was one mission where it just would not let me drop a bag. Like once I picked it up. I could not deliver it to the place it needed to go, and therefore the mission just kind of like was stuck, and I, I couldn't do anything about it. Were you able to reset the um, the switch and have it kind of go through okay, or did you have to start everything from the beginning? I did that mission a second time, and that same problem happened again, and oh, I just no. could not beat that mission. I don't know what it was. I've had also a few glitches online, too. Um, not to the same type, but they were just different. Maybe it has to do with the host. I've heard some people tell me that the host's connection could filter glitches through other people. So maybe it's not the game's fault, but I know I had a mission or two where all the cops that are sent to fight us or sent to intercept us just kind of like stood in place and never shot. Or they like were literally all just aiming at the floor and shooting into the ground <laughs> and just other weird stuff. So <laughs> that's, that's funny. Yeah. But the, the, the real, the real problem I have the on blind play isn't anything that's technical like that. It's just the, I guess the mentality of the players online, not that they're like trollish or anything, but people don't have patience for stealth online. And nine times out of ten, if I pick a mission that has even any kind of suave element or, or, or grace required, right, the first second of the mission, a person just runs into the building and starts shooting out windows and tripping alarms and does not care. I was given a piece of advice by Darkus, actually, he told me that if you host one of these games, you can just reset it anytime somebody trips an alarm and maybe look at the message after a time or two. Don't be stupid, but uh, that just led to people quitting the room and me waiting for a replacement. So 
Yeah, that could be a hassle, it's, I can imagine. Yeah. I think what it's really going for, what you have to do if I'm going to enjoy this game, or someone like me, if, it, 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 is to find people to play with in local multiplayer and actually like talk it out and you know say what we're going to try well, yeah, to do I mean, this the right way. <laughs> I figured that you guys could strategize better just talking to each other right there and, and yeah. face-to-face. Or getting some people on the Discord chat room and you know having three players that I know online and playing with friends online would work too. I, I did it at work actually with uh, two other people at work and uh, that made, even if it was just the three of us, it made a world of difference in how much I enjoyed some of these missions actually. Just talking and hearing from them immediately like, oh guys, I, 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 there's somebody in the backyard, don't go in the backyard I think he'll spot you if you go there and like just getting that instant feedback and actually communicating with each other added so much intricacy to the to the missions that i felt like that's the only time i really felt like i was playing what the game was supposed to be yeah no definitely i mean that's how the switch is you know made for yeah um just to have more interactions with other people yeah um i did i i, I like the variety of missions though there there were so many types oh there's one mission where you just have to go into a mall and cause as much damage as you can before you can leave and then you get picked <laughs> up by a helicopter Oh, wow. I'm a little uncomfortable with how many cops you shoot in this game, though. So if you're you know, if you're like me and you don't really like being a bad guy, it kind of makes you feel a little wrong because you mow down a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> Dang. But Dang, Casey, how could I you? I know, I know. It, the only plus is that they do add a farcical element. Like, the game doesn't take itself that seriously it's not like farcical's too strong but it does have this like dark comedy element to it so it kind of dulls well, that a little bit much. i mean i know you can um customize your outfit you can change your mask you can kind of go dressed as however you want i mean granted if you can unlock it in the game that's true there are a lot of really good customization options uh not just in gear and there's a lot of gear like all sorts of weapons melee pistols guns uh, a variety of armor um, and this actually is pretty interesting because, like I mentioned before, there's that like uh, casing mode where you can try to be as inconspicuous as you want. But if you go into a stage wearing like a full f- flak, uh, flak suit, you know, and, and a suit of armor carrying a rocket launcher on your back, people are just going to be suspicious of you no matter what you do. <laughs> Well, I'd hope they'd be suspicious. Right. Um, so you can balance it with stuff like, uh, I, you know what, I, I'm going to forego armor, I'm going to wear just a two-piece suit, and that's going to not sus- raise any suspicion, but it's not any armor. So they kind of have this interesting trade-off. But the perks that you can unlock are equally interesting. Um, different options of how you can uh, customize your character's abilities for missions I like a lot. Like, uh, for example, I chose a perk set called the Ex-President, and one of the things I like about that is that you get to carry, at a certain point, you can bring a armor bag, which is a suitcase that you'll have for the mission, and you can start the mission, you'll be wearing the two-piece suit, so you're just all, you know, Mr. Inconspicuous, and you can go into the mission very stealthily, but once the, you know, once everything hits the fan... You can open up the bag and then you could put on your real battle armor, your bulletproof vests and stuff, and you'll be ready for battle when it comes time for it. And I like I like doing that. That's kind of my style. I like to go in subtly, but then come out a blazing, you know, (laughs) come out with your rocket launcher. Yeah, that's it, you know. So um, and there's all sorts of things. There's perks that, you know, reward people who are good at headshots or people who want to be the, the lock picker, who want to be the engineer or the hacker who can, like, mess with computers if that comes up in a mission. And there's all sorts of ways to feel like you're useful in different ways to the team. And I kind of appreciate that. In fact, when I was playing with team people we didn't play that often but when i was playing with my co-workers even after one or two games we were like "Ooh, uh i really like doing this role i'm i'm gonna look for the perk set and the skills to unlock that will make me even better at doing this part of the job and you know maybe one person just wants to be the enforcer the person who sits in the back and when the cops do come he's the one who can kind of hold the fort and everybody finds a little role that they like and 
it feels like a team, and that's really cool. Yeah, definitely. And I think that's see that's that's really cool. Yeah, I think that's where this game shines. I do not think if you, if you're only planning to play this online with randos, you know, they're fine to play with on time to time. I think, but I think if you and maybe just to do that to unlock your equipment for the real game. But uh, if if you do not think you can find people either in our community or in any community or in person, you might not get all that you want from Payday 2. At least that's just the way I play. You might be fine. If, if, if all you want to do is go in and start shooting things up on every mission, then I think you'll enjoy this all the same. Yeah, no, definitely. But I mean, I'm sure I'm sure you won't have any troubles finding anybody to play with um, in the Discord group. I mean, it always seems that there's at least a handful of people that want to jump on each night. Yeah, that's true. That's true. And uh, and you can make different profiles in the game. So you can actually, let's say one night you can play as your enforcer, you know, big defense guy. But then maybe you're playing with a different group of people and now they need a technician you can switch to your technician profile and it'll already have all the things that you've unlocked or equipped for this other, you know, quote unquote character uh, that you can play as when you're playing with different people. So that's pretty nice. nice. All right. So yeah, that's that. I'll see if I can get more games of that in the future. Um, but you know, it's, it's, it's entertaining me for now. So overall you would recommend the game to people who are interested. In I it. think it's a, it, it's worthwhile a game. You know, also, I want to to address, actually, a lot of people keep complaining about how it compares to, let's say, like the PS4 version or the, you know, all the other versions out there. And they complain about it being, again, it's the same thing they did with, like, Skyrim. They call it, like, the inferior version. And I honestly, I'm just kind of sick of this argument. It's, It's not meant to be compared to those things. Honestly, if you have a Switch and let's say a PS4 and you only ever plan on playing this at home, yeah, sure, maybe the PS4 version is the one for you. But that's not what we're that's not really the point here. The point is if you are a Switch owner who doesn't have access to the other versions and if you want to play this on the go, if you want to bring it to work and play with people or, you know, meet up with friends at a convention like PAX, this is the version for you. I, I honestly, unless I'm looking at them next to each other and looking closely, it's not like I feel like this has bad graphics compared to any other version. It's only when they do those, like, split screens where they, like, show you exactly side by side, you can notice, oh, yeah, the graphics are a little less than on another version of the game. But that doesn't really matter, I think, to most people. So I kind of get sick of that argument. I would agree with you on that. For the most part, I would be more apt to pick up this game on the Switch just for the fact that you can play anywhere and you can play it with your friends as well. Yeah, yeah. All right, Um, plus, talking about playing things with friends, uh, you actually... Just got into a game that, uh, you know, it, it's a game that has been out for a while, but it's something you newly got into just when they had the big ARMS test punch launched where everybody yes, was invited yes. to play. You picked up ARMS itself. Yes. Um, unfortunately, I picked it up before trying out the uh, test punch. I know that's that's something that I shouldn't have done because I didn't get to experience the actual online gameplay with other new players. You could have still played in the test punch, even if you bought the game. No, definitely. <laughs> definitely. But as soon as I got the game, I got, I got so absorbed into it. It's such a fun game to be honest. I mean, I'll, I'll talk about it more, but um, as soon as it finished downloading, um, I got home, I opened it up and I just started like looking at the different characters, what arms they had, what I was able to do. And I just jumped right into it. I mean, to be honest, I didn't think too much of the test punch. <laughs> now, in hindsight, I should have, you know, gone online and played with other people as well. But for the most part, I'm enjoying it a lot. It is a game that, to be honest, I did not get originally because it is a fighting game. And with most fighting games, they have their own communities. And everyone in the community, they're, let's just say it, they're just really good at it. So, I mean, <laughs> these players such as myself, who, you know, who are noobs, who to not enjoy as much but arms does a good job at engaging all types of players i could definitely see myself playing this for a long time and especially with like everyone else on um on the discord who has arms arms the gameplay itself it's simple enough that um a new person can go in and pick it up and just start enjoying it from the first minute but there's a lot of different combinations where more advanced players can go in and get more competitive with it. The characters as well, they're they're pretty quirky in my opinion. Um, I do like the character designs. I've lately been playing with Springman and Ribbon Girl. So keeping it simple, going with the baseline characters, yeah. 
Yeah, the baseline characters. I've also tried some of the other ones, but the um, the Mayan character I've tried as well. Okay. Um, but overall, all the characters are well designed. They have their little quirks, their own little personality to each move set they do. And in addition to that, every character has a different set of arms. You start off with three different sets for each character, and I believe you can unlock them as you play more. Yeah, you earn those coins, and those coins let you play that mini game where you can go and unlock yeah, yeah. random ones, which is pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I haven't played much of the mini game because I've been so focused on the actual gameplay itself. Well, it gets it gets kind of tense uh, because right before you oh, put yeah, in the coins, definitely. you're like, I better do good because I just earned I spent a lot of time to earn these coins and I better get as many bonus items as I can in this shot I'm taking here. <laughs> Yeah, my first playthrough, I didn't get anything, actually, sad to say, but I wasn't too disheartened because I actually enjoyed the main gameplay where you get the coins, but yeah, I should probably focus on getting more arms, but right now, I'm just going through the actual game, trying out each character. Have you tried the giant arm mode, the big arm mode? No, no, I haven't. I saw that. Um, I still have yet to get to that one, but it is definitely on my list of things to do. It did intrigue me a lot just because I believe it's like when you get hit, it's a one hit KO. Yeah. But so the whole point of it is that you're trying to dodge all these hits. I think that's a really good idea for almost like a, a, a training mode in teaching people how important every throw can be or every punch can be since you really have to actually pay attention now. You can't just be like a lot of people when they start, they just throw punches and hope they hit. Hey, there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, but but I think this teaches you to the importance of being a little more cautious and not just throwing a punch randomly, but throwing it when you're when you see an opening and waiting for Definitely. that for that chance that you can hit. And um I, I found that to be kind Definitely. of informative in that. And that's one thing I will I will add more to is that I've noticed that the longer I've played, the more I've found myself observing the opponent and just kind of waiting to see what they're going to do and reacting accordingly. Like if the person moves right and leaves himself open, I'll find myself trying to, you know, take that opening, hit them. Mm -hmm. um, with that also being said, as each character has a special set of arms and they each do their own different things. I know the, uh, the Mayan character, I can't remember his name, I believe it's Missingo. His... One of his punches um, launches this little scorpion, and it kind of is like a little homing missile. It doesn't do much damage, but it does distract the player in trying to dodge it, which creates these openings for you. Mm -hmm. But overall, it's I find myself evolving with the game, and that's something I do enjoy a now, lot. Now, that, that actually makes me want to ask, how much experience do you have with other fighting games, let's say, first off, in general? In general, I do not have much experience um, aside from Smash Brothers. The reason I ask is because I'm I'm curious to hear if you feel like after playing Arms that you might be hungry for a game that's maybe one step more advanced than this. Right now, I would say no, just because I'm still new to Arms. Mm -hmm. But I feel that eventually I will get there. Arms is such a good game just to get you in the door, yeah, just to start playing. And definitely the way I'm progressing right now, I'm noticing myself doing different things, trying to change it up, trying to get better. And down the road, eventually, I may get into, you know, something more serious. Mm -hmm. With that being said, I mean, the like I mentioned earlier, the growth that you go through in the game, you know, it's something that I enjoy. And um, I know some other other uh, community members, they mentioned to me that to not only observe my opponent, but to observe myself and see yeah. what type of routines I get into just so that I don't get into a predictable set. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a big thing in, in fighting games. And I think that this is like we talked about on last episode, we with the fantasy, the fantasy strike fighting game, that's really kind of a very simplistic like Pocket Rumble is shooting for uh, a fighting game. I think that we're building this interesting ladder right now where like the, the simplest fighting game in the world right now is Dive Kick. And that's kind of set the most baseline idea. Arms, I think, is like a few steps above that, right? Now you're actually getting into movement and, and, and these punches and customizing your attacks. And I think that a next step up might be something like a Pocket Rumble or a Fantasy Strike where... It's a little more closer to conventional fighting games with those non-complicated controls. And I feel like they're slowly bringing everyone up to the more competitive games over time. Though I'm sure plenty of people will just be happy at... Nope, ARMS is 
all I need. I do not need to get into anything more advanced. I'm happy here. And that, then that's where I'm going to play. Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, it, it's been a lot of fun playing with it. And I can definitely see myself having more of an appreciation for the fighting games. And speaking of a uh, stepping stone or another rung on the ladder of fighting games, I actually <laughs> did get to play some of the new expansion character to Pokken Tournament DX. I forgot the name for a second there. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were going to say Pokken yes. for a moment. Uh, Blastoise. I thought I was going to say Pokken too. <laughs> Blastoise, it came out and I've been having fun learning him a little bit. He's a he's a interesting nice. he's a nice little addition here. He has his own mechanic. He's interesting in that they really focused on the fact that he has these cannons on his shoulders that he is a even despite being this big brutish looking Pokemon, he's a ranged character heavily. Like he really f- focuses on zoning enemies out and okay. dealing with them in different ways when they actually manage to close in. So it sounds a little bit uh, like the difference or the opposite of Charizard. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, appropriately enough, he is a polar opposite of Charizard, who is the grappler, who gets in close, has a few good, interesting range of things, but he really is about getting in close and throwing you with his massive seismic toss. Blastoise has a lot of ways of shooting you back. Uh, and protecting himself if you do manage to get close in on him. Uh, he can go inside his shell. He has lots of escape moves. He can push you back. He has a lot of, like, you know, check kind of moves. Um, he's He feels powerful, but he's not, like, a brute, and he's a lot more mobile than uh, I expected him to be, and he, he's kind of a, you know, he, he is a fun addition. Um, I'm not... He's a lot more approachable than... Actually, the, the 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 two ghost characters that uh, that I liked, Chandelure, who is like the zoner of this game, is also rather a little bit hard to get into. Uh, Blastoise offers a easier to understand, uh, more well rounded zoner type character, and the other one though, okay. the other expansion character of uh, Aegislash who is just a rather, I mean, he's a technical character, and he has the two modes, and he has lots of different attacks in each mode, and he's about countering and predicting. He's a little harder to grasp for new players, I think, whereas Blastoise, again, is just a lot more easy to grasp. I mean, he's a Gen 1 starter Pokemon. I, I think it fits that he's really back-to-basics style fighting with uh, easy-to-handle moves, but a interesting skill set. Okay. But yeah, nice event. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm happy with the price for both these expansions still for these two characters but i believe they're what fifteen dollars it was fifteen dollars for the two of them together with the support characters i'm i'm still not willing to say that i feel that that is a just price for two characters in the game but uh, i at least feel that the characters are in in themselves fun and you know what if you're if you've been playing this game as much as me anything that keeps it fresh and adding new stuff i guess is okay but yeah no definitely and anything to keep them supporting pokin in general it's such a fun game I've, i haven't played as much as you and overall it's another game that i do enjoy it's you know i mean who doesn't like pokemon and you know it needs those kind of events like the arms test punch and 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 stuff like that that really get people together because between the like the test punch and the, the the splat fests and the you know all these events that Nintendo throws that make people feel like they should be playing this game in particular on this particular weekend that that just really builds up the hype and I think that that's something that Pokin doesn't quite have behind it. Okay, definitely, I agree with you there. Mm-hmm. Anyway, the last game I've actually been playing in depth this week is the long reach this is a uh, a pixel art style horror point and click adventure game little survival horror kind of thing going on here reminiscent if anyone yes is the one that you had on um, lens with the meme the uh, oh, right he praised the uh, little tiny sunlight yes because he is in your pocket or something. they have a lot of jokes like that he has a yeah when he picks up the uh, flashlight the description reads praise the tiny little sun and uh yeah, and, and it's actually filled with a lot of little jokes like that, which is kind of contrary to what the game is going for in that it is a rather dark survival horror game. It's in the same vein as Lone Survivor, which was a game I was really into back on the Vita, which was another post-apocalyptic uh, you know, world wiped out by a virus sort of thing. This isn't quite that level of wipeout. This is 
a outbreak of insanity, I want to say. So the game centers around this uh, technician in a lab who uh, he goes in. He's like doing some experiment with uh, it's like transferring skills to people mentally, kind of like how the Matrix when like, you know they plug you in and all of a sudden I know kung fu. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You're doing some experiments in something similar to that, and you pass out while learning how to play the piano, and you wake up, and everyone in the in the laboratory is gone crazy, like in different ways. There's just one guy who's just running around thinking he's a dog. There's a uh, you know some woman who's just like paranoid in the corner. There's one guy who thinks he's in D and D, and then there's one guy who wants to kill everybody with a lead pipe. And oh wow, yeah, and so you are trying to find your way out. At least in the the part that I was playing, um, you're trying to find your way out of this lab so you can go and like alert the police or whatever. But it seems that they've hinted that that some of this is escaped and that there's people out in the world who are now raving lunatics, uh, and it's it, it's kind of becoming an epidemic out there. So the game actually plays out. It's, you know, your typical point-and-click adventure type game. You walk around the different rooms. You pick up items. They kind of have that usual video game logic that everyone hates. And I was a little frustrated with this game, too. For example, one of the very first puzzles you come across, there's an elevator you want to get on. But the buttons are all, like, ripped out. And you have to find an item to poke it with and i'm just like okay i'm gonna find a pencil or something there's gotta be something in here right <laughs> no you have to can't use your finger <laughs> yeah no you can't use your fingers there's like too many sparks and it's dangerous so all right so you the the, the, the long story short is you have to find a a dog bone that you get from the guy who thinks he's a dog you have to convince him to give you this little toy and then it's not just enough that you have this dog bone you then have to like carve it into a pointy shape to press the button and i'm just like dude Literally oh. any object lying on the floor would do. And like, I can find something. I didn't need to go through this convoluted puzzle to push this button. But whatever. It's it, it's how they make you solve puzzles in these games. But what really adds an element is that normally you don't really have to worry about threats in these style of games. You go around, you can explore, and just kind of pay attention and figure out how to solve things. But you do come across, once in a while... Uh, these psychopaths, um, these people who are just paranoid delusionals, who will murder you if they catch uh, a, a glance of you. And you oh, wow. you have no defense in this game. If, if they see you, you run, and then you have to run into a room and find a hiding place because if they catch up to you, one whack, boom, you're dead. Okay, that's it. Oh, wow. So there's no form of defense or anything. Nothing. Nothing like that. This is not made to be a combat game. And in fact, getting around these guys, like, they're not generics either. They're just, each one that I've met so far is a person with a backstory or, you know, some someone who knows them. And, and you know, they're not just generic crazy people. They're, they're, they're people. So you have to figure out, like, how are, I have to get in that room. But this crazy guy is keeps poking a dead body with a stick in front of it, and I I, I have to lure him away. And uh, so you have to devise a weird and somewhat sick little plans. Like some of them are pretty gory. Like this game is, you know, it it shows you like you know guts spilling out and 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 bodies hanging from the rafters, sort of thing. And it's it's a disturbing setting, and you have to use some of this in some rather interesting ways in order to solve these problems like getting this guy trapped in a room by luring him with another dead body into a room and stuff like that. I was having fun with it. I was enjoying it has a oh it has a really good sound effects too. Like when I hear the the crazy guy like just walking around in the background, he does like that crazy hobo kind of murmur like <laughs> nice and that's classic and it, it's, it's very it's very um i don't know it's unsettling and they do a thing with the sound actually where if someone's on the other side of a door and you can hear them 
like if your character can hear them, but they don't want to, maybe you can't literally hear them yourself. They do this little effect, like a little lighting effect on the floor that lets you know you hear footsteps. So you could see footsteps basically and see where they're coming oh, wow. from because this, so conversely, can they hear you? They can. Um, or I think they more or less see you because one of the big things is you do get a flashlight and you do need that to navigate a lot of the areas, but. Once you turn on a flashlight, now the crazy people can see you from much further away. So you have to be oh, wow. careful. You might turn it on and all of a sudden, rah, you know, crazy hobo comes after you. Um, so <laughs> it's a little scary even using that, but you're afraid of the dark more. So, <laughs> but it's a good, <laughs> right. it's a good tension device. Only problem I have actually though with the story and the setting so far is that they really kind of blow too soon what is going on like in any of these games a lot of the fear is not knowing what's up like why are there zombies why are there these weird monsters in silent hill like what is happening to me why did my dead wife talk to me you know that kind of stuff knowing why this is happening early on you can talk to a character who gives you the typical like i have no time to explain well i'll tell you what's happening later if you push her like you even say like uh yeah i want to know she just lays out everything, and she told me exactly what's going on and why these people are acting crazy. And it really suddenly sapped a lot of my fear. It kind of like made the game a lot less interesting. So I was like, huh. my suggestion if you do play this game, don't ask anyone. Don't don't push for information because I feel like it's better if you don't know what's going on. <laughs> but will you eventually get the story if you don't ask them? I guess or so. I, is this the only way? I'd like to say I can tell you one way or the other, but I've hit a bunch of problems that have made it me not... Oh, no, not again. Yeah, this game has... No, this is even worse than the payday problems. So the long reach has a lot of bugs in it right now, and I know that the developer is aware of them, and they're going to be trying to put out some patches or something, but honestly, when a game comes out with these with these glitches, it's... This is really unsettling to me, and I'm my game is freezing a lot. Like I will sometimes oh, no. play it for literally like 30 seconds and it freezes again. And then I try to reload or I try to reset the system. And then when it tries to load my game, it'll take maybe a minute and a half to load the game. And once wow. it just wouldn't load, period. It just would go in this infinite loading screen. And I left it alone for 30 minutes and my game never loaded. And that would just happen again and again until I finally gave up and I just had to restart the game and lost my save file. No way. Seriously. Yeah. So as much as I actually like, like and I'm intrigued by this game, it still has its flaws other than these glitches. And But I think it's, in, it's still a worthwhile game if it didn't have these bugs. And right now I, I cannot recommend anyone to pick this game up until those are sorted out and honestly i don't believe for a second that they didn't know these were in there because these are very prevalent i've heard a lot of people have the same problems it should not have come out with this and i'm, I'm a little i'm a, kind of upset with that and i think that there's going to be a lot of people who are upset that they can't finish the game because it keeps freezing and they have to start over so maybe i'll come back and i'll mention this game again when i hear that the updates happen and that the bugs are cleared out but right now i have to advise people just you know sit on it don't 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 pick up this game right now and hopefully in the future when it's fixed we'll find out more about what you know what could have been a very interesting unique title on the switch Good to know. All right. Thank you, Casey. <laughs> Thank you guys for listening. All right. Why don't we move into the news rundown and talk about all the stuff that's going on? Definitely. The news rundown. Here are your headlines. So Nintendo has provided more information regarding the the uh, what cables are safe for your system and which ones will not brick them. Um, for the most part, it seems that Nintendo, when they were creating that the Switch, they they ended up using components that are not compatible with other cables. So in essence, whenever you use a third party uh, cable or a charger or stand or whatever it may be, um, it will not be 
compatible with the Switch itself, and this seems to be the issue that's been causing it. But it seems kind of interesting that this did not start happening until with, you know, the latest, uh, the latest update. Yeah, that's the thing that's, like, got people upset, is that Nintendo, I mean, they know that they used a non-compliant USB-C type of wire, but I guess they either just disregarded the idea that people would use third-party things, or... They were just like, yeah, you know, if it if it causes problems, we've given them the warning. But I, I, I really have to feel like they really I, did. They not know that it could brick the system at all. I, I feel like they have to have known that that was a possibility. And if so, I feel that they needed to emphasize even more than they mentioned because obviously they've mentioned offhand like you know don't use third party accessories blah 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 you know the usual thing i feel they needed to emphasize more than they no, did definitely how definitely. bad and 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 that they feel like this is a very real threat and you know now people have paid the price for that and i know they've um also stated um stated online that using a usb a to usb c charging cable is perfectly fine as long as it has a 56k ohm resistor so as long as everyone's cables is compliant then you should be fine but it's overall safe just to use what came in the box uh, on day one. Now, here's the thing. Here's the thing that has me scared, though. I have been using, and I'm not going to do this anymore. I've been using the Nintendo wire, but I haven't, I, 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 or rather, I've been using the you know USB-C cables that came to charge my controllers, not the thing with the big fat like adapter at the end, right? But okay. I've been using that wire with the standard, like those little plug adapters that you get with, you know, your iPhone or whatever, like those yeah. things. Now I'm wondering, have I been risking my switch bricking every time I plugged it in like that? I don't think so. I mean, because it seems that the problem lies in the actual wire, the the connector of the male to the female portions. That seems to be where the issue is. Because, I mean, I've been doing the same exact thing you have. And so far, I haven't had run into any problems, and I haven't seen anything online that indicates that, that doing this will brick your system. Okay, okay. Yeah, so far, like I said, I, I've been doing that even since the update and having a problem. But again, I'm kind of scared now, and I'm not. The only thing I I feel like I've researched a bit of and I saw people have confirmed is seems safe is using particularly the Anchor power um blocks to recharge as a portable battery for your switch and that's the big thing if i couldn't use the power bank i would be i'd be livid i because i we got that purely as my switch charger and i need that for big long trips like when i'm going this weekend so at least i believe that that is safe though don't quote me on that i, I i'm not a tech wizard and if um, but I'm I'm just like I'm very worried now about everything because now that I know that you know these things aren't fully compliant and that random things seem to be bricking them I'm just nervous. That's all I can say. Yeah, and that's understandable. Yeah, but I'm gonna still be using the the power bank because I I kind of have to. I'm just I'm not gonna use the standard wall charges. What I'm just gonna do is I'm gonna charge my switch on the go with the power bank. And then I'm going to charge the power bank in the wall. And that's like my only like, you know, system for this. <laughs> nice. All right. Anyway, um, moving on in the news, we have, um, oh yes, this is, this was actually announced today at, uh, they showed this off. Um, I believe yeah, they've been showing quite a bit of a, um, a video of gameplay of this, actually. The Dark Souls uh, Remastered Edition, it's getting some frame rate improvements, which, you know, for the most part is very much needed. I mean, granted, it is an older game, yes, but in certain areas of the actual gameplay, the frame rates would drop drastically and hmm. it'll start, it'll just start spazzing out. Like, one oh, okay. moment you'll run into an area, you'll think you're running away from the monster, but then it'll freeze, and the next thing you know, you know. It was just, it was just a hassle. And there's one particular area that, that this affected the most. Um, and, you know, as most of you who have actually played it, um, it's in Blight Town, you know, the notorious Blight Town, as we all call it. But hopefully this will all be better now with the remastered edition. The videos that they are putting out from PAX East, um, it looks very promising. There's a lot more texture in the world. There's a lot more animation. Um, I know there's some comparisons from the old um, version to the newer version. And some things that jumped out to me in general 
were that the world is more it's more animated so blades of grass would be blowing in the wind there'll be some there's a lot better lighting effects in the game itself when you're by a bonfire there'll be a shadow cast and they'll be flickering mm. um this was not all present in the old version cool cool it's, it's nice to hear a story at least for once where people are talking about the improved graphics for a switch version of the game rather than comparing it you know disfavorably to uh, to it's being ported from another system so oh, no, I, definitely yeah especially for this title you know i, I feel like this is <laughs> yes, going to be I mean, a very major title for the switch so it's nice to just get that out of the way that, that that's one yes. complaint we won't have to listen to and it's very reassuring to hear all these positive things coming out of pax east so yeah. i mean I, it just gets me more hyped to you know for may 25th um definitely i already have mine pre-ordered and i'm ready to go but um i'm looking forward to seeing what i actually experience again in this game Mm-hmm. I also just thought this is cute. I saw today that they are with the uh, Hyrule Warriors Definitive Edition that's coming out uh, May 18th. They uh, just showed off, at least in the EU uh, pre-orders, this little rupee lamp that is going to be coming oh, with I the game. I saw that. Yeah, it's pretty cute. It- I was kind of wishing that it would be kind of like um, a clear rupee with um, different LED colors on the inside. Because, I mean, why would you want a green rupee? I want a gold or an orange <laughs> rupee. I want the most money. Come on. I think people want the most. I, I, I would think the red because that's like the most iconic color of a rupee. But a green probably does the most like to light your space it's not huge it's about the same size as the box for the switch game so it's not like a it's more of a decorative piece but it does look cool yeah no it's it's a nice it's a nice little um addition that they included with it yeah and for the most part we'll see how many people actually will pre-order this um for right now i think i'm going to pass on it but it is definitely that i have seen in the past and particularly through etsy i know they've sold a lot of these products with um Mm. you know just through various various vendors Gotcha. Uh, Moving on into the uh, updates, we got to look at a few of the new characters that will be coming out in the Splatoon 2 Octo expansion, or more like... Talk about horror. Yeah! (laughs) This is definitely indicating, this is such a darker, almost like -like, X-Files-like Cthulian horror of of their world. I never would imagine these type of characters to be in the Splatoon's world. I mean, just, I mean, they're they're dubbing them, what, the deep sea creatures? But for the most part, these are the deep sea creatures that you would see in, you know, the real world. Um, And one particular that jumps out at me and that kind of creeps me out is that uh, this one weird-looking fish, it's, um, it looks like Glob, the best way I can describe it, it looks like Jabba the Hutt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He he looks very like just frightening. Um the one that freaks me out the most is it looks like it's like she's just dressed like a librarian, she's reading, you know, a book, but her head oh, yeah, like- is like an explosion of little amoeba particles. Like she has like a weird jellyfish kind of head, but it just makes me think of like this is like a thing you would fight in Silent Hill. She is just this freaky librarian that would come at you with a baseball bat in that game and i was it's it's definitely a different tone from what we're used to the cute inklings and even the octolings are adorable in their own way i didn't when i played through um splatoons i didn't think the octolings were that bad looking but these ones actually man i would be a little bit terrified if i saw them in my dreams (laughs) yeah and we also got word of the next splat fest this weekend and yes uh, yes this will be baseball versus soccer (laughs) which which team are you on uh, I'm all right, so I have an interesting little reasoning behind my choice here. I'm not a sports guy in general. My the one sport I really follow is uh, hockey. I like the the fast moving of it. It's kind of like a MOBA. I actually realize hockey is a MOBA to me, where the goalies are like the towers, and it's this five on five kind of thing going on. And anyway, I can get into that in another story. Um, but I I'm not just picking this because you know I'm I'm an American and and soccer doesn't really fly here. I'm picking baseball because and this was a great explanation I heard from one of my favorite podcasts, The Dice Tower, which is a board game podcast. They the the host of that show talks about how he likes baseball. He thinks because it is the closest sport to a board game in that you you kind of have a lot of these it's it's not like fast in the heat of the moment decisions. It's very heavily based on 
thought out, turn based almost decision making, and lots of statistics go into everything. Like this batter comes up, he has a like thirty five percent chance of getting a you know a single, like like ten percent chance of a double, that kind of thing. You have to make the choice, am I going to bunt? Am I just going to go swinging? Maybe I'll intentionally walk this guy to get to the next one. There's a lot of these strategic choices that are involved in it. And so it plays out at a board game kind of pace. And uh, I think once he mentioned that, I realized that that makes a lot of sense to me. And I looked at baseball a different way. And I kind of understand it more. And I, I feel like it's just a little more enjoyable to me since then. So, yes, I'm going Very with baseball because it's a board game. <laughs> Yeah, I never heard of that comparison before. I mean, I can definitely see it, and it makes total sense for the most part. Um, but yeah, no, personally, I would go actually with soccer. It's just something that, I mean, for this, I mean, in this, for the slot fest, I'll go with soccer, but it's just something that I am more accustomed to. It's more part of my culture. It's just what I grew up with as a kid and always playing as well. I mean, I was never good at baseball. I always ended up getting hit by the ball or, you know. <laughs> Where did, where did you where did somehow. you grow up? Um, I grew up here in SoCal, so okay. uh, we would play in the streets. I remember, and every time I'd play with the other kids, I would get injured badly too. I mean, <laughs> I'd have to sit out for the mo- for the you know the whole entire game. Wow. But um, but yeah, no, I've always enjoyed soccer. You know, I enjoyed both playing it and watching it. It just there's always a lot going on, and and just the different the different tricks that they do. I always find interesting as well. But um. But yeah, I mean, with soccer, it's it's a very to me. I feel it's a very quick paced game. Mm-hmm. Um, it's more to get, or it's more of a game where you get um, sucked into, and you. I mean, it has a huge fan base. It's more of a of a world game. It's pretty much on every continent. So, well, that's the thing I think is the biggest draw, and the thing I appreciate most about soccer is that it is the closest thing to a world sport, a game that everybody plays and this common ground that I think is really important in in the world, in in developing a world community, just having something that's this common ground that everyone understands and people can just kind of get around as long as they don't take it to like that, those violent levels that the most hardcore, you know, European soccer fans can bring it to, you know, as long as it, we <laughs> yeah, can no, stay definitely. away from there, but just like appreciate it as this is a, a game that we all compete on. And honestly, I, I believe that in the ideal world, a game like soccer could replace war. I feel like that is like the ultimate evolution of humanity where we can settle all major disputes through a uh, agreed upon contest of skill and strength. Hey, that's why they have the Olympics. Exactly, exactly. All right, so um, that's pretty good. That's pretty. We'll see how that goes this weekend. Oh yes, big one uh, announcement update this week. We have Rocket League version one point zero point five, which is out now. Most notably, adding at last tournaments to the game. Yes, tournaments. Uh, this will allow, at minimum, eight teams, and I believe the smallest team is uh, two players, but uh, goes up to 128 teams max uh, per, oh, sorry, for, for a bracket size. So, wow, that's a lot of people playing. Yes. And if it's, if it's teams of two, that's 256 players that can be involved in this. So this is going to be huge for the uh, just the online community for it and, and playing it. And most notably, I think, for Switch Cups that we're going to have in, in, in the Discord community and otherwise. Uh, I, I probably think it's about time we start uh, hosting some Switch Cups with uh, this game here. And I think that I will probably, when I get back from PAX, I'll immediately start planning and preparing us uh, to do this, of course, it does mean we're going to need at least 16 players to confirm they're going to be part of it, and uh, we'll see where it goes. Well, I'm from sure there, we could but... find those 16 players, especially with everyone on Discord. Um, I mean that that channel in general is fairly active every day. It the people are in yeah. there talking about uh, the Rocket League. Yeah. So if you guys are hearing this, uh, start figuring out your partner for some tournaments because we've actually been having some great cash prizes uh thanks in part to you actually you've been uh contributing to our prize pool uh oh yeah you were in the bomberman tournament last week yes yeah i was actually um that was a fun tournament even though i didn't do as well as i expected to i mean um <laughs> i was i was anticipating coming out on um, first but uh, man I, I just 
I, I don't play Bomberman as much as I should, but I mean, it's a fun game. It was myself, uh, Mecha Dragon, and Brutus Barb. Brutus yes. Barb, congratulations for winning for the most part. Yeah, he he totally owned the whole entire game. And <laughs> yes, I, oh yes, also contributing to the prizes, uh, we were sponsored in part by Lord Bones, who donated yeah, uh, several uh, eShop gift cards to our winners and i want to give a little shout out to his twitch channel he does a uh, stream at twitch.tv slash watch play love he said he's playing a lot of sea of thieves lately but he will be adding some switch games to his repertoire in the future so definitely go check him out there he's also signed on to help sponsor prizes in in the future so uh, we'll definitely be keep giving out those gift cards, uh, especially to him. And again, of course, thanks to you for chipping in as well. I know you've been very generous with uh, the you know the fan base and helping everybody get motivated for to compete. Of course, it's always fun getting people hyped up about events, you know, and just getting involved with the community more. On on the same note, actually, I just wanted to announce that um, this weekend on Sunday, I, I am hosting a Mario Kart tournament online at um three o'clock uh p.m um pacific standard time and you can find it the the name of the tournament itself is sun worshiper tourney i'm also giving away some some eShop codes with that um if you want to participate make sure you go on to discord chat and check in on the mario kart channel in order to be entered into that the uh top two contestants will receive a uh 35 and a 20 um dollar uh, e-code for the eShop. And I will also be raffling off two additional $10 eShop code. So yeah, come on down and check us out and participate, have fun and, you know, play with other people. I know there's a, there's a good amount of people already um, interested in the tournament for this Sunday. So. Oh, also, I just want to also mention, uh, they added Twitch support to the, uh, rocket league update as well but it has not been activated yet it sounds like it's just in the code and this the feature isn't working right now so i think it's a switch that they're going to to flip at some point or uh, we'll see oh um are you a fan of the bethesda games are you like like fallout i am actually i do like skyrim a lot um well the the elder scrolls yes right but there is a new set of tables for pinball fx3 which we're always happy to see and this is actually a three pack of bethesda classics including a table themed after fallout doom and yes uh the uh, Skyrim's table. Yeah, that's pretty exciting. I mean, I'm I'm definitely excited about the uh, the Skyrim uh, pinball table. I mean, it's always been fun playing FX3. It's nice that they're always adding additional stuff um, for the Switch. I love seeing how they bring them like the characters to the tables and the 3D renderings. It's always very authentic feeling. Yeah, no, definitely. So that's one thing I'm definitely looking forward to. Mm-hmm. Shantae, half genie hero, is uh, also getting some expansion packs. This uh, April 10th, actually, they have the Shantae Ultimate Edition, and this is going to include all the DLC, but plus a few extras will be packaged in with it, uh, namely Costume Mode, which is not just simply a, you know, dress up the character kind of thing. It's actually three different, well, costumed themed stages or or modes of play. Each one, she has a whole different power set. Uh, There's one where she's a ninja, so she does like little ninja vanishes and different wall jumpy kind of things like a ninja gaiden sort of thing um and the stages are all designed to take advantage of that uh there's like a swimsuit mode so she's like beach stages she shoots a volleyball and uh and and there's also one where she's like a police officer and this has a lot of this uh calling things out of the background into the foreground and messing with platforms like that all different power sets Three different ways to play. Shantae's already a classic, uh, very solid platformer game. And uh, so, just more excitement. You could buy this extra if you aren't getting the Ultimate Edition, you know, but it will come, like I said, prepackaged for free if you are a Kickstarter backer or if you get this uh, Ultimate Edition collection. Nice, nice. Um, Darkest Dungeon did release a patch, and in it, it's miscellaneous bugs and fixes, but also another big takeaway from this is that when you're playing in handheld mode, the letters and the, the text in general 
are a lot bigger and it's just improved readability. Um, I know this was one of the complaints that other people have had about the game when they were playing in portable mode. So it's nice that they were able to, you know, adjust it and make it more of an enjoyable experience. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, so why don't you give us a rundown of the new releases for this week? Definitely. So on April 5th, yesterday, uh, we have Sally's Law, Sling Ming, Urban Trial Playground, Neo Geo Samurai Showdown 3, Johnny Turbo Arcade, Bad Dudes, Inferium, Super Rocket Shootout, Animated Jigsaws, Beautiful Japanese Scenery, Octocopter, Double or Squids, and for April 9th, we have The Bunker. On April 10th, we have Super Daryl Deluxe, Masters of Anima. On April 11th, we have Bomb Slinger. And down the pipe, so f- these are the games that either just were given uh, release dates or were totally fresh announcements for the Switch in general. We have Shelter Generations. This is the game where you're playing like a, a, a family of lynxes and you're just trying to survive. And I think you start out as little pups and you you know grow up and survive. It's a little adventure game, kind of cool. Uh, Battle Chasers Night War was announced just today to be coming out uh, May 15th. That's one a lot of people have been waiting for. Uh, Yesterday Origins, this is a cool, uh, this is an interesting sounding uh, point and click adventure, a little more mature theme and, and story, but it has to do with uh, your, your character who has been given immortality through some ritual, but the only side effect is that every time he would quote unquote die, he comes back without any of his memories. So now you're trying to go back and find out what kind of ancient history you have from before you were last murdered, I guess, uh, so to speak. Uh, but it has a lot of like very dark themes to it. Uh, Shaq Fu actually has uh, got a date now for June 5th. Uh, Breaks are for Losers is coming out in April. As Divine Hearts, which is a classic style JRPG, uh, which is coming in April. Regalia of Men and Monarchs, Royal Edition coming April. Cas- Catastronauts, this is fun. This is in the theme of the uh, like Space Team or FTL style games where you're. it's a four-player co-op game where you're all running around a spaceship trying to put out fires literally and figuratively and trying to keep the ship together while you overcome various uh, space dangers. Always fun and frantic kind of thing. That's coming out in summer. Uh, The Spectrum Retreat coming out 2018. It's another first person puzzle game. Uh, Not Tonight. Now this is interesting. This is a political game. It's a game with a message. In particular, this has to do with the uh, UK leaving the Brexit, the uh, EU. Yeah, the Brexit. And it's kind of got a Papers, Please vibe to it, where I think you're playing, like, uh, you know, law enforcement at various places, making sure certain immigrants or certain types of people don't get into either, like, you know, like a nightclub or that you, you deport people who don't belong in the country and like you're checking for papers or other criteria of who gets to stay and who gets to go. So it's kind of a, yeah, it's a kind of a heavy handed political message game. And I'm just kind of, I'm just kind of interested what people feel about games like this. I mean, I'm going to hold my opinions till I talk about this in the future when it comes out maybe closer and I know more about it, but I think it's a topic that's worth discussing just generally what people feel about games with a a political message attached to them i wouldn't mind checking it out i mean it's not often that you get to see political games come out yeah uh firewatch coming in 2018 above is coming 2019 double cross and warhammer 40k death watch were announced for the system this is a a tactical strategy game and it's with the Warhammer Space Marines, and those are always cool guys. This was out on mobile, but it's, uh, you know, it was highly regarded on there, and it was listed in a certain you know, uh, online stores, so expecting to get this on the Switch. actually from here just close out the show with our usual ending and do a system switch and i'll let you do the honors of uh, kicking us off 
with uh, your choice of a game that you would like to see brought over to the Switch. Definitely. So my pick was Paper Mario and the Thousand Year Door. Um, overall, I would love to see a Paper Mario game come over to the Switch. And more so, Thousand Year Door was a game that, for the most part, it's been a fan favorite. And there was just a lot that you're able to do in that game, whether it be cooking, um, side side stories, or just exploring Rogue Port and just the world in general. But I feel that the Switch definitely needs a good Paper Mario game. Um, hmm. I know there's other games more recently would be Color Splash, but overall it would be hard, I believe, to bring that over. And Paper Mario in general, The Thousand Year Door, would be a great addition to the Switch. What what, what makes you, let's say, pick that over, let's say, Mario RPG? Yeah, um, Mario RPG in general is a good game, yes, but the graphics are just very dated, and I don't think it would translate well for it to come over to the Switch. Switch, and I know they had it on the arcade for uh, the Wii U. My hunch is that eventually it will be on their arcade again when, when, and whenever you know it, Nintendo comes out with its online features. But I feel that the graphics and the art of the Thousand Year Door would translate pretty well to the Switch, um, as okay. well as just just the gameplay overall too. Fair enough. Strong choice. Strong choice there. I'm going to go with a pick in honor of PAX East, a game I saw there last year. And when I saw this game, I, I was really pulled into it. And I asked the developers if they had any interest in bringing it to the Switch, which had just barely come out at the time. And they said, oh, no, no real plans for it at this time. But... Uh, the game is called Iconoclasts, and the developers actually recently were asked about bringing this game to the Switch in an interview recently, and they sounded a little more open to the idea now. Um, I'm, it's had its run on other systems. It uh, seems like it has a shot, or at least they're interested, and maybe now they can get around to it. And uh, But Iconoclasts is a side-scrolling action kind of metroidvania game but it has this really great animation style to it very uh, kind of anime-ish but uh very colorful bright worlds with a lot going on in them and you play various characters throughout the story and each one of these characters has a different uh kind of a unique tool that they can use to get around and fight with uh, for example one character has this big wrench which allows them to kind of hook into different points that they can pump up let's say or open a doorway or ride these little rails that go around in the different stages and um maybe you'll go through that same area as another character who can get to areas that maybe during the first chapter you couldn't reach because now this person gets around a different way but it has a Mega Man Zero kind of vibe to it. It's like that kind of futuristic-ish kind of setting. Futuristic, but people still kind of live in like a cast system with a lot of like archaic um, overtones going on in it too. So uh, I'm interested in the setting. It seems to have a fairly strong story basis. And uh, just the characters all spoke to me and it's just beautiful. So Iconoclast. I really hope to see this weekend, this at the show floor at PAX East. And I'm definitely going to push to see if they want to say whether it's coming for Switch or not. Nice, nice. All right. Um, so that is our show again for tonight. Thank you all for listening. Is there anything? And thank you, uh, Edward, for showing up. Is there anything that you'd like to give a little plug for or shout out to before we close up for the night? Just want to say thank you for having me on to the show. Um, I've enjoyed recording with you. Twice. So <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, a second time. Um, you know, it's 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 always enjoyable just to listen to you guys for the most part but you know it's just as much fun doing it um just to have these conversations with you directly and not just on Aww. discord but um definitely want to you know again give uh, remind everyone about the tournament this weekend for the mario kart if you want to join come on over um and also to encourage people to join us on discord chat you know there it's a vibrant community and i'm always pushing for people to join on there and for the most part, uh, being a new person who is new to Discord, I've enjoyed it a lot. So, um, And then also there's Patreon as well. If you guys remember, check out the lens. There's always a fun yes. uh, thing to check out. So see the see the random shenanigans. The lens, I, I, I swear, I'm going to be blowing up that lens this weekend. So it's like, it's uh, what's fun. that one game? The oh, oh, Mommy or the, the graphic novel that you talked oh, about? Oh, Otome is the genre. Third. 
the Otome, but I have gotten my review code for the Charming Empire, and I will be definitely starting that up probably on my bus ride to PAX this weekend. So Nice. I look forward to your review. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you. All right, everybody. Until next time. Switch it up. Thanks for listening. You can support the Switchcast by visiting us at patreon.com slash the Switchcast and join the review crew by rating us and subscribing on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts from. Also, check out our Discord chat where we have an enthusiastic bunch of Switch fans in a family-friendly environment. Also, join our Facebook group for daily discussion and quite a bit of activity towards the Switch itself. You can also contact us directly via email at kc at the switchcast.com and jv at the switchcast.com. Talk to us on Twitter at the Switchcast. Thank you, Heatly Bros, for the theme music. And check us out on our website at theswitchcast.com, where we will post all relevant links and show notes. Promotional considerations provided by publishers in the form of review copies of games. <laughs> Oof, my tongue is getting tied again.